Um, but I've, got, I've had a particular interest actually principally spawned out of that, that particular programme in procurement strategies and, um, and contract management and also the role of the project manager in the delivery of contracts. Um, just a general observation, I see too much um, uh, dominance by the commercial parts of the business uh, overriding the person that's actually being held to account for delivery. Um, and potentially, yeah, I, I find that, that that's uh, a, a trend we need to try to, uh, as project managers, try to sort of uh, kick into touch gently. <coughs> so, you'll be familiar with this now. Um, so, we've decided what we want. So, we've got a concept, we know we've got a project, we know it's viable. We've developed the overall procurement strategy um, and we've broken it down into high level packages. So, we're good. Um, so what I'm looking at doing is helping you to think about uh, what package what package strategies you might want to look at uh, and they could be quite diverse depending on what your, pro what your project is and what the individual packages are. So in the guide you'll see um, very simple in my case step process that you go through and boringly I'm going to take you through all of these. Um, so the inputs, you, um, you should be familiar with the inputs because that's what uh, John and James have been talking you through, but you've got your procurement strategy document, you have your package scope, um, you've got a bit of an idea about your interactions and dependencies that you might have between the packages and you've an idea about what kind of relationship you'll be looking for and what we've um, cleverly missed off here so that you can spot it is that you'll probably also have an outline budget and then at the end of this um, this evolution um, we should have our best fit contracting strategy for each package um, we should know if we're able to use standard forms of contract there are advantages of doing that because um, if you use a standard form or standard clauses, there's a wider understanding of what those mean and what they give you, the strengths and weaknesses, advantages, disadvantages and so on. Um, you'll have a pretty good idea about what uh, remedies um, are applicable to your packages um, and you'll um, have thought through your risk handling approach um, and that will have factored into you picking your, your uh, package strategy. Um, you'll have looked at your approach to gain share, levels of incentives, and you'll have updated your budget. So, um, when you're looking at the individual packages, as opposed to the overall procurement strategy, um, you need to think about the strategic importance of the package. Um, so, what happens if a particular package is late? It might not be, um, or, or it underperforms, it might not be sort of critical or seem critical. So taking the Olympics, um, uh, you might recall that you know, the Olympics were about to start and there were no security guards. Now that might not have been seen as a particularly critical package or seen as particularly difficult, but the impact on the Olympic Authority's ability to deliver a safe, secure Olympics was quite, that was quite fundamental to it. So, so you know, it's you might need to think about um, the strategic importance of a package um, in the overall delivery, which could be disproportionate. Um, it might be a very high-tech niche niche package in an overall construction program. So. Um, you know, or it could be something that you could buy off Amazon. So you're going to have you're going to have a whole range of different things in a in a, in a large uh, project or contract project. Um, you're going to need to think about what your payment schedule is. Are you going to pay on completion? Are you going to have milestone payments? Are you going to pay as you go? Again, it's going to depend on the type of package, the type of contractor that you're you're looking at. Um, John touched on risk quite a lot. Um, risk identification and management and ownership are really, really critical. So, um, uh, the gentleman over there was talking about sort of transfer of risk. Uh, it's quite fashionable 
to, or has been quite fashionable to try to transfer, for a client to try to transfer risk. Um, it can't always be transferred. So going back to my security guard example, that contractor may not have been a particularly large contractor. It may not have been a particularly valuable contract um, in terms of the overall cost of the Olympics. But the, um, the, if the Olympic Authority thought they could transfer the risk of provision of security guards, they couldn't because they didn't turn up on the day, but the risk was still with the Olympic Authority. So thinking you have transferred the risk or even paying to transfer the risk doesn't mean to say you've actually done it. So I think that's something for people to think about. Um, the motivation of your contractors is potentially quite different as well. Some, you know, if you've got a FTSE 100 company, they're going to be looking at the market, looking at shareholder value and what the city think of them, and that will drive certain behaviours. You might have a niche technology company, you know, maybe a university spin-out, where um, they attract people by giving them really, really interesting things to do, but cash flow is quite an issue. So you've really got to think about what type of organisation you want. And, you know, if you want a specialist design contractor, good, because actually that might be the best way for you get, to get your design. And you might need to put extra money into managing an integration risk because it means you can get the thing that you're really looking for. Um, so, you know, think about the motivation and don't assume just because you're motivated in a particular way or your main contractor is that the other contractors that are going to be involved are going to be um, see, seeing things in the same light. Um, okay, so we're now into information gathering. We just want to know, we're picking on a particular package and we, we want to think about what's going to help us to decide on what to do. So. We're looking at the participants, drivers and constraints. I've touched on that a little bit um, more. But you might have, for example, a package, going back to my Olympics again, um, where the overall Olympics is very time-driven. But you might have another package which might not be critical path, say the velodrome, where safety is a particular concern. So you're, you're going to be looking at the, the drivers for that package are going to be keep it off the critical path and then it's going to be about making sure it's absolutely safe to operate or safe to find around as a cyclist. Um, um, strengths and weaknesses of the likely parties, again I've touched on sort of financial strengths or technical strengths. Um, we need to really think about um, what we want and who we're going to go for and understand our supply base. Um, contract specific um, factors. Uh, we might want to be looking at standard solution um, or we might want to have uh, something that is, is very, very niche and specific so we need to bear that in mind too. Um, maybe you can read that. How does it fit in? What's, what's critical? What's minimum functionality? That's another thing that's quite important. What can you live with? So. If finance gets tight, what's the minimum that you can actually live with? Because that's going to fix some of your constraints. So sometimes you need to leave some scope for innovation and not over-constrain. Otherwise, you also pay for over-constraint. And you potentially take risk back if you over-constrain. So. And if the previous state has been done properly, you get quite a lot of your answers already. One of the things that I think is very important um, when you're looking at this is don't treat this as if you're trying to trip your contract, your supplier up. Whether you're working in partnership or whether you're just, or you're buying a, a almost commodity, not quite because we don't go there. Um, you, you're not trying to trip them up. You want them to work with you. You want a successful outcome is one that's successful for if you've got two parties, you and your supplier, it's one that's successful for both of you. They are supposed to make a profit. We're not trying to stop anybody make a profit. Um, so, you know, most people, you know, you'll have all heard this before, most people turn up at work wanting to do a good job. Not many people turn up and think, you know what, I'm going to really hash things up today. Um, so, 
If you get your contract right for both of you, then you stand far more chance of being able to avoid dispute and, and to get the results that you want with your budget and have everybody wanting to work together another time, which is also a pretty good outcome. Um, so sometimes when you're looking at what form of contract you're using or what clauses you're using or what your payment schedule might be, try to put their hat, their hat on. So think about, would this motivate me to reduce cost if you impose this contract clause on me? If you're going to put a huge amount of pain in a pay and gain share and not cap it, what's that going to do to my behaviours? Am I going to be thinking about innovation or am I going to be trying to stop myself from losing money because it could put me out of business if I ended up with that much pain? So just, you know, you're not trying to trip them up and think about what it, whether it would work for you because they're only the same kind of person as you with a different badge on their you know, name on the badge. Um, when you're looking at um, constraints in particular, play a little bit of so what. So if this constraint wasn't applied, would I still get what I wanted? Um, what you don't want to do, on the other hand, is not put a constraint on and ask for, you know, army boots and then leave the constraint so loose that you could get flip-flops because then you just don't get what you want. So think about, think about constraining to the right level but not over-constraining. Um, my example was you might not care what material a table was made from, but you do care if you can't get it through the door. So... Um, Right, so this is, this is the sort of meat of uh, what you're thinking about. What is the right package in your project will depend on technical certainty, market availability, risk profile, time constraints, integration challenges, contract duration, risk appetite, and budget constraints, and I'm sure you can think of a bunch of other things as well. Um, most of the most common contracting um, or contract strategies we can fit onto this sort of grid with complexity and time. So I'm going to start with the, the least complex um, initially, schedule of rates. Um, this is when you're looking for principally sort of commodity type items where you know what you want um, but you don't necessarily know the timing for when you're going to want them. So. An example that um, I'm familiar with is, is food for the military. We know what we want. We know what we want. To, we know we want to know what we're going to pay for a box of cereal, but we don't know what exercises they're going to be doing. We don't know what operations they'll be doing. So we don't know exactly what the timing is going to be. So a schedule of rates type of contract for that would be appropriate. Might be appropriate. Um, can I just check the complexity you're referring to is contract complexity, not solution complexity, isn't it? It's solution, solution complexity is what we were thinking about. Well, I think maybe you want to do <laughs> <laughs> I've got quite a long time. You can ask yeah. me. Yeah. Well, but having, as I, I said that, it, it's com often it's complexity from the supplier's perspective. So you can have very complex projects. But the supplier is the expert in doing it. That's their bread and butter. That's what, that's what I'm really trying to So do. actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. from the supplier's yeah. perspective, it's what I do. And, what, and if you can define what you want, you go over to you, yeah? But if, on the other hand, it's a supplier goes, well, okay, that's sort of what I do, but I've never done it before, um, that might be a different relationship. So I think it is what... And that supplier then might lead into contract or complexity. But if you have a management consultancy organisation, the schedule of rates is boring. Mm. But the complexity could be enormous. Mm. And therefore it's way at the top, not way at the bottom. Mm. That's, oh, that's can, what can, I'm trying to argue. Oh, I see, right. Can, can, I, can, I run, can I run through and then yeah. see if you ask the same question again? Because I suspect we might have used some of the terms that we've used yes. might help to clarify. Okay. Um, so bear with for a minute. <laughs> um, so bill of quantities, that's sim in, in the way that we've interpreted it, it's similar to a schedule of rates, but you've got a fixed quantity, but not necessarily, you might have variable timing. So um, you know you're gonna need, I don't know, a certain amount of sand to go into some foundations, but you don't necessarily have an absolute certainty of when you want each delivery to arrive. Um, you need a fairly 
good, you know, fairly sound program, but you're probably going to be um, pushing arrive at different points. Ah, uh, no, I need to get back. I rushed. Fixed price contracts. This is where I hope I'm going to start answering your question. Um, this is what it says on the tip. It's a fixed price for a given program of work. Um, and so the, con the contractor, sorry, the, the customer, needs to be able to sufficiently define what they want to allow a contractor to provide it. So if it is, as John said, something where this is what I do, I know how to do this, I've done it a dozen times before, it's, it's straightforward for me, then that contractor is not going to find this com complex and a fixed price contract might be totally appropriate. If on the other hand, there isn't a contractor out there that has done this before, fixed price might be not the right answer for you. So I think it's, it's appropriate when you've got a supplier base that is able to deliver, you can define what you want, and you can def um, and you in sufficient terms to allow somebody to actually deliver it without you driving your cost up. Um, what you have you you start to introduce risk as soon as um, you you add change in. So you want a stable um, requirement, uh, uh, and sometimes if you um, oh, and if there are a lot of customer dependencies, so if you as a customer um, I have a number of deliveries that are form part of the overall program and you don't do it on time or your items aren't done to the spec that the the um, supplier is expecting then you very very quickly pull the risk back onto yourself and the fixed price can go out can not be as fixed as you thought it was going to be um, so it's about um, sort of stability of, of uh, of requirement. Um, then if you think about the payment, uh, we could have milestone payments, you know, payment on the delivery of something. You could have a, percent, a lump sum, sort of percentage complete, or activity schedule, which is a kind of combination of the two where it's smaller packages. So you need to th again think about cash flow, think about how you're making sure that you've got certainty that, of delivery, making sure you can check things off and pay for what you've been given. Now what's the next one? Um, frameworks. Um, you can have um, a framework agreements where you've typically got a range of providers that are able to do something, um, and you want to have uh, enable competition so that you can still run a competition, but you're not going out to the market for a full competition each time. Um, so you'll have a basic contract that they are operating under and then you'll compete packages of work. Um, that's typically the sort of thing we'd use that for. Um, strategic outsourcing, or um, that's typically service, uh, you know, service delivery, IT services or sometimes HR, um, typically to a service level of agreement um, uh, on a rates basis, maybe with a pain shape. Pain, get, pain share, gain share arrangement associated with either achieving or exceeding service delivery targets. Um, right, target cost, target cost incentive fee. Um, these, uh, well, all three of the, well, target cost and management contracting are typically going to be fee based. So you've got costs and overhead um, with uh, overhead and profit. Um, so a fee base, straight fee base might be a sort of just like a rate card of fees. At the moment I'm working as a management consultant and we have um, literally a rate card I'm put in at a particular rate. So my hours are paid for at that rate. But then there are milestones um, or achievements that are expected from the management consultancy team which then trigger or don't trigger uh, an additional fee. So the profit margins are supposed to be low on the basic costs but then you get your additional profit from um, achieving milestone payments. So that again that's really where we're looking at having something which is 
cost based. It's very complex. It was very it's very um, difficult to define. Um, so it's a fee based arrangement. So by input based, that could be fee based cost per unit of input, or it could just be show, show us your books. Yeah. Um, reimburse you what you can demonstrate you spent on our on our project. And then, well, cost reimbursable. I mean, um, years ago, I was a reactor designer, um, and um, we were paid on cost reimbursable contracts. Um, it was very, very integrated with the client, um, and uh, but we were just pe literally paid by the hour. It's very low rate, low profit rate, but very, very stable business. Um, One of the disadvantages of those is there's not very much incentive to manage cost because you pay as you go. Um, if we move to sort of partnering and collaborative contracts, um, uh, this is where we're looking at trying to play to each party's strengths. Um, with the intent to sort of incentivise, and this is really where John and I met, was working on partnering um, type contracts. Um, you're, you're almost trying to encourage mutual dependency um, because you want it to be the case that if that you you are almost driven to work together for both of you to be successful, um, you're driven to work together to achieve the com common goal. So um, at the moment, I'm working with the army and um, I'm working with DNS which is a, a defense contracting organization and with, uh, on, on arm typically on army products and um, we're trying to save money because <coughs> everybody in the public sector is trying to save money I'm sure you're aware um, and there are some things where DNS can uh, take certain actions that are going to reduce costs up to a certain point but thereafter the army have actually got to also take action for you to be to so you might be able to make one or two percent difference but if you join together and join forces you might be able to make ten percent difference um, and in some cases it's literally a case of somebody making a decision the army might not understand how important it is for them to make a decision by a certain date um, but if they do then you can suddenly get a lot more a lot more um, uh, financial benefit. So it's driving and encouraging those mutual dependencies so that you um, so that you gain a better result overall. Um, target cost incentive fee, I think I've, oh yeah, I've covered that there, sorry, I think I'm running back on myself. Um, so what um, and then we can move on to joint ventures, which is sort of like an extreme version where you've actually got, um, where you're looking at um, consortia or legal partnerships and that sort of thing. And then you're going more into PFI. Um, and, and the like. Um, they're quite special. Uh, PFI for, uh, in the public sector typically um, has been tried quite a lot, but you've got to be able to define your scope. So there are PFIs in defence where um, the requirement for quantity of a particular service has been very, very <coughs> overstated. So you end up paying for 100 units of something, but you're using five, but you're still paying for 100 units. So under those circumstances, you've got to be really clear that there's third-party revenue opportunity. Otherwise, you, if, you, if you can't sell the service to anybody else for whatever reason, you're stuck with it. So a really good example of a PFI is a satellite, where you can have shared use of a satellite. So it's very expensive to get a satellite up in space. Um, if you can share the costs of that, but you've got pilot capacity, if you can share the costs, then that, that's a really good use. But buying a niche generator that nobody else in the world wants and storing several thousand of them isn't necessarily a great, great use of a PFI. So that's entirely fictional, is it? Adam? That's entirely fictional. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we, I'd like you to do is to um, I'm going to let really imaginatively say um, scenario one, two. 
three. One, two, three. So think about, based on your copies of the guide, your slides, your own knowledge, think about what you think the most appropriate contract packaging strategy is going to be for each of those scenarios. So, um, <coughs> if your spokesman from this table one would like to... Uh, okay, on. we're, um, we're building an um, energy generating plant from uh, recycled material and uh, it's a reasonably mature technology. Um, there are several um, suppliers who are able to build and construct and plant uh, for a, a sort of typical cost of around 150 million. Um, what we're going to go for is a price-based contract. Um, however, we think there's room for in incentivization um, as a frill such that if they deliver early, we can get the, com the, get the plant up and running. We've got a revenue stream from electricity that we can sell in the market, provided the revenue is going to be um, more than the uh, possible incentivization, And that's really our solution. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So has the other table one got any thoughts on, on that? Uh, we pretty much followed them, oh. unintentionally or coincidentally. <laughs> Um, and agree with the sort of uh, the gain share element, as it were, for hitting the commercial operation date of the asset earlier. But we'd also um, uh, consider a sort of pain share. So sort of obviously, if we missed uh, the commercial operation date, which is going to cost us in revenue, um, they could share it. And we also saw that as a means potentially of offsetting if we had variation orders throughout the life of the project, because although the technology is mature, it, it there might still be some. Uh, 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 areas where we incur additional cost if the technology changes or, or standards change or so. Um, yeah, so whilst we could probably weather some absorption of the variation orders if we if, if we still got operational on the date needed, um, we'd be inclined to share some of that pain with, with, the, with the principal contractor if we, if we didn't make it. Um, Would you consider capping that or...? Uh, well, I suppose you'd have to have a, a, some sort of limit of liability on on on. Uh, well, you wouldn't really see it as LDs, would you? It's just it's pain share. But uh, yes, because you can't have a, an endless pot of pain. <laughs> Otherwise, you very quickly run out of incentive for why the why yeah. your contractor should remain on the job for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, first, first, so as the one who came up with these. <laughs> It was exactly, that was exactly what we had in mind. It's a well, even though it's technically complex and I, and I wouldn't have a clue how to deliver it, you know, etc., which doesn't say much, but anyway, for that person, it's their bread and butter. So for the contractor, providing you can define what you want, and that could be at the performance level spec and leave them to define the widgets, the bottom level of the work down, uh, down structure, price-based structure, um, price-based package um, and in terms of we did have in the mind a, an incentive potentially which is actually in positive incentivization is underused uh, where they're getting commercial benefit as I understand them and I haven't been involved directly in any one of these is they get paid for the offtake from the national grid but they are also paid for actually recycling per ton or whatever it is so again why are the local authorities commissioning them because they've got a problem with, with which this stuff is otherwise dumped somewhere else um, just a little point on the damages yes you, you'd almost certainly have some damages in there if the client was issuing those variations and the contractor was able to demonstrate that then they'd say because of that we couldn't deliver to that time mm -hmm. So while bet bonuses can be stuck as a point in time, yeah, we've got a contract with the councillors to start delivering from this date and you can fix that, whatever happens, that then creates, okay, there's a problem, let's both overcome it, but damages might have to go back yeah. because of the effect of that change. Yeah. yeah? Okay, which is another reason why bonuses are a good thing because they encourage people to overcome the problem rather than going, oh, it's because of you, no, it's because of you, so Right. So, we'll go for this table two, if that's okay. Is that right? Is that table two over there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> would would uh, your spokesman like to talk us through scenario two? Yeah. Uh, well, we thought it was a bit of a strange scenario. 
John. <laughs> based on, literally based on Sheffield City Council. <laughs> John. Uh, but given that if we start from the fact that the budget comes from central government and is generous for okay, but the, the point there really is that there's, there's budget coming from somewhere else, so you actually got a, a point where you don't have to be spending someone else's money as the council. But the, the, the scenario seemed to be quite odd in that they'd understood where this ring road was to go, line level and final look, and yet they don't seem to know what's in the ground or where the services are or where the land assembled to do it, which are all those points that you got as a bullet. So we, we wouldn't suggest that we would cure that in mind. Mm. You take the risk out and you pull. Uh, the detail to enable the design which the council said it would like to do. So let the council do the design, but you can't do the design unless you know what you're designing to deliver mm -hmm. on. So we would look at a like, cost reimbursable or a consultancy arrangement to understand what the ground is, to understand what the uh, services or the utilities are. And then when you completed your design, transfer that to the Contractors who build the road in the best way they can build the road uh, on a fixed price basis, so you actually know where your liability is. Mm. And hopefully, it will come in without putting that, uh, that budget that's someone else's money. Mm. So, the other table, too, would you like to give your um, thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we looked at this and we thought that the intensified shared pain game with uh, miles on payments would be the best option because we know what we want to build, we want to build a road which is pretty much faster. Um, what is unknown is what's underneath the ground. We could do, mitigate the risk by doing ground surveys, um, mitigate it that way. Um, that was it really. Yeah. Right, shall I tell you how, how I've done it? It's partly yours. They got a contractor involved early and paid them on a consultancy basis. But the problem with civils in a, an existing environment is well, I don't know what's in the ground because there's existing buildings over it. Yeah, I've got to get these orders to get people to move out to negotiate the agreements. So I don't know exactly when they get out. All that sort of uncertainty. But they did try and mitigate it by getting the contractor involved in on an early basis. And then they were changed to a pay and gain share arrangement um, where the contractor had input into the risk, but things weren't... In absolutely in their control. So do you remember that diagram where I think James talked about hard interfaces and trying to create a straight line? Sometimes you just can't do that and therefore that's when you want to create as what Anne said is, is almost codependency. You want to create an, a, an arrangement which drives people to collaborate rather than go well you didn't give that and you didn't give me that. Okay so it's a, it's a combination of you two. <laughs> All right. So table three. Oh, three. Sorry, big pardon, I'm looking wrong. One, three. Go on. um, so we kind of flitted between two different ideas, and, and ultimately it depends on how confident we and the supplier are that, um, that they can actually do it within the, the time and budget that they initially set. Um, so because I'm from a, a kind of science research background, I'm maybe more used to things being a little bit fuzzy, so I, we traditionally do this in a kind of milestone payment thing, where if, we, if we're certain to a relative degree that it can be done, it's just going to be fairly tricky. Um, we rely on the suppliers providing an accurate bid uh, for their time and costs, and we would break that down into milestones. There was a fairly strong argument as well, though, um, that if that technical component isn't as simple and as straightforward as, as like it, you might have to move to a more sort of risk arrangement, uh, risk sharing arrangement, and possibly even look at sort of cost reimbursables. Um, from prior experience in kind of research projects, what can tend to happen with that is the supplier might just tell you that the project isn't finished while they're trying to make improvements, and sometimes you can find the project drags on when actually the original objective is not been met. I don't think we've settled fully on an answer, but it, it depends on how confident us and the supplier are that they can do what they've set out in the account. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. And that's not in the question. That's very complicated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the next question. We're on the third scenario. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm in that industry, so I'm not sure about whether I should be answering that. <laughs> I can do. <laughs> um, actually, this shows quite a, a dilemma that uh, the, the defence industry has because the information that's needed to move things forward tends to be rather restricted. Um, but yet, we want to have innovation coming in from all over the place. So to, to facilitate that's quite difficult. So what we our consensus was that there needs to be kind of a fixed price on this, which has um, a very well understood end result, because the end result is something that's manufacturable. Now that by its nature means that it can't be some organizations which are very innovative, but don't go through to manufacture, which is unfortunate like in the defense industry we prefer to have that but at the end of the day it's got to be manufactured so there needs to be um, elements there of understanding how to manufacture something and the limitations there what the uh, in uh, industry is like and what the existing tools are like and what um, uh, what, what, what the end, end result and being able to understand the technologies themselves so it's quite a, a diverse requirement so I guess that means, yes, if it was a fixed price, right, how much is that going to be? It could be massive because the risk is you've got to do a lot of stuff and you're not going to know how to do that. So what do you do? Well, we estimate it, then we, we, we put some, some extra on for the fact that it's going to cost more probably. We don't know how much that is, so somebody has to estimate it. So you end up with an enormous, untenable budget, which clearly you wouldn't want. So what do you do about that? Well, um, clearly you have to break it down. Um, you, would, you, would want, you might want an ultimate budget, but you'd need to have it restricted by some kind of gate process um, that would allow the risk to be reassessed. Um, so the client would need to be able to say, well, we can break off who we don't think we're gonna get there at this point, and then, you know, contract is broken with that. Okay. What we did have was a really interesting debate as to whether the fixed price contract model or something a bit more uh, flexible, which provided for the innovation, would actually solve the kind of problems that both of those contract proposals are going to suffer with, which is the client has a fixed budget, it needs technology, stuff's got to be replaced, it's important for society that they have these new components, etc. Contracting needs certainty as to what they're being asked to produce. As does the client. The client has that certainty too. The client has that certainty, then things start to get tricky uh, on all sorts of fronts. Um, we don't need to start talking about stakeholders in the case. <laughs> we did have an interesting debate as to how easy the fixed, oh, sorry, how ready, how, how able, sorry, the fixed price model is to cater for this kind of environment. My view is it doesn't cater for it very well. So yeah, we were in a similar sort of debate, and I think what the assumption that we made, um, which confused that further, was the fact that um, it seems that there's going to be a lot of collaboration because you've got the technology to a certain you, point. You've got you're clearly going to carry on working with them, and they say, how does that work into the risks of the subcontractors and the contractors? Because you're going to be impacting their success, and so it's just moving we around in circles a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which illustrates there's no right answer uh, and that your people are reading a lot more into or have to read into a lot more and understand assumptions, risks, etc. on this. I have to say in my mind when I dreamed up with that it would be an input based contract as in probably fee, fee plus, yeah. That was in my mind but when I look at your things I go actually, yeah, series of milestone stones, quite feasible with breaks, yeah. And probably you know what the fees are, so you'd look, be looking on the basis of how was each of those made up. Yeah? So you'd have insight into the costs, but you let it on a price basis. The other or you could have it on a series of... In the interest of time, gentlemen. Yes. As chair, um, I guess. Um, <laughs> right, I, I'm now one minute over and I'm in the way of lunch. So no, I'm you've just... got Alistair. You've got Alistair. Oh no, I'm not in the way of lunch. In that you case, are, I'm in the way of Alistair. Alistair's not in the way of lunch. Um, 
So uh, just, I'm not going to get cover these in any detail, but other things to consider are um, second order risk allocations. So we, when you're making your basic des decisions, you're be going to be looking at sort of high probability, low impact, or low, uh, high impact, low probability. But there are going to be some things which, if they happened, could be catastrophic. So you do have to think about how you're going to deal with them. Um, and these, uh, so that's going to flavour your the detail in your contract. Um, you're also going to look at the extent of pain or gain. There are some other slides in your pack that show some some thoughts on um, or, on pain and gain share profiles um, and and positive in incentive versus negative incentives. Um, but that's our scamper because. Um, Remedies, retentions, I mean, this, the, the, the words say quite a lot. Retentions when you're withholding part of the payment, typically for a period, um, to, is to encourage people to deliver defect-free work. Uh, guarantees, um, that's often a parent company guarantee or a bond. Um, it's a bit like insurance policy. Um, warranties, I mean, you're familiar with warranties on... Or domestic products, you know, if something goes wrong within a year, you expect somebody to repair or replace it. So, um, same logic. Dispute resolution, basically, you want to try and stay in the bottom bit of my um, the part. Um, so management escalation, that's just talking amongst yourselves. Um, expert opinion, um, that's when you get uh, the views of a third, of an expert third party, which you do or don't have to listen to, but it's, it's getting somebody independent to who actually knows what they're talking about to, to come and have an opinion. Executive tribunal, that's when you have a panel that hears the evidence on both sides and makes a recommendation, which again doesn't have to be adopted, but it's, it is by definition an escalation. Um, mediation, that's looking um, at a single person or organisation who is scuttling between both parties to try to drive a, um, a, an agreement on a way forward. And then um, a, a dispute or avoidance resolution board, that's when you have a board that is sort of like kept on board, pardon the pun, um, with the programme as you're going along and if you like tries to foresee potential disputes and head them off at the past before they happen uh, or in the event that they happen they're a bit more informed. Um, and so, but after, if that goes wrong at that point, then you're into, into uh, consulting the lawyers. Um, so I would ask if you had any questions, but then Alistair would run out of even more time. So um, Where's Alistair gone? maybe save until later, if that's okay. Where's Alistair gone? Oh, there he is, right behind the pillar. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, okay, right. So, thanks, Anne.